seen the title here, I think, is um, uh, what the title I intended is a circular saw, a gold vase, and a little, um, and a little red wine. And that, that was actually something which Lord Snowden uh, described. That's how he described um, the idea of the most felicitous afternoon he could imagine, you know, making things and feeling relaxed. And you know, that was a, but can I have the first slide or do I have to press, do I have to press this? The first and only slide, I think. Yeah, it's all working. I'm sorry, it's so difficult to follow the future of sex. I, anyway. <laughs> uh, uh, Stonehenge is there not just to uh, emphasize the primitive force of my arguments, um, but to make the point, which I've always felt absolutely impassioned about, that civilizations aren't remembered by their public sector bordering requirement or any other abstract financial uh, notion. Uh, civilizations are remembered by the stuff they leave uh, behind. You know, like most people's obsessions, mine were formed in, um, formed in childhood. Um, I was never actually taken to football matches or fishing or whatever it is meant, is meant to constitute um, you know, healthy growing up. Uh, but I was dragged around the factories which my father um, managed. I can remember now, you know, Saturday afternoons with the smell of hot oil and the and, you know, and swarf underneath your feet. And that introduced me to the, uh, you know, to the romance of machines, which is um, something still lived... Um, um, still with me now. I mean, my father was the sort of engineer type who was absolutely obsessively interested in how things were made. I mean, he could actually be a frightful bore about it. He would lo he loved to hold up, you know, um, drink you know, tins of beer or tins of coke or something and say, do you know how this was made? And, you know, seriously, I don't know if you know how a, how a drink's tin is made, but it's made a tiny little pellet of, of, of aluminium put into a die and hit with immense force. And it's an extraordinary clever thing. And anyway, I, I was brought up thinking things like this. And I was thinking about it, and, and I, I, I got to the stage of wanting to give a talk like this, this time last year. I mean, I've always been, uh, as you perhaps know, interested, um, interested, passionate indeed, about des um, design. Um, but I, my passion about design is coming together now with the, this idea, this theology, this John Ruskin revival I want to, I want to introduce to you today um, about the importance of making things. It doesn't matter how many in brilliant industrial designers you've got if you haven't got any industry for them to work in. And I started thinking this. I was actually on a... Um, exactly this time last year, I was on, um, I was on a Vaporetto in Venice... One of, the little, um, one of the little steamers. And I started testing myself on that thing which my father had said to me, but did I know how this was made? And I was just looking, looking at the Vaporetto, and I just kept on thinking, the deck, how's the deck made? Has that been cast or forged or stamped? Or, and, you know, how was the superstructure made? And I realized I, I realized I didn't know, and I'd become so ashamed by not knowing, even though I fancy myself as, you know, having some sort of expert insights into the nature of design, that I've decided, you know, this campaign now, we've got to understand more about making things, and I'll tell you the reasons why. I've actually even developed a fantasy conversation with the Prime Minister, which goes something like this. So I asked, um, I, ask, um, I said, Dave, Dave, uh, Dave, do you actually know what a rivet is? You know, I'm serious. I, I think, it, I'm, I'm, what I mean is, I mean, I, here's David Cameron, somebody who's admirable in many, many ways, super smart guy, the beneficiary of an elite education. Um, I bet you he could not describe the way a rivet works. Um, and that's, I think that's struck me as absolutely um, um, deplorable, because if you know how a simple thing like a rivet actually works, you know, you understand all sorts of valuable stuff. You understand the theory of mechanics, uh, you understand um, the history of structures, material technologies, stress, load paths, and all the aesthetic limitations of working in metal. Understanding a rivet, you know, is... Um, is an education in itself. I got another fantasy as well. My, fa you know, my, well, my fantasies are much more wholesome than the last speakers. My, 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 fa my, my, fantasies, my fantasies are about chairs. I, want to t I would love to take Dave, or indeed any member of the cabinet, or indeed the opposition front bench, and ask them, uh, Mr. Miliband, could you tell me how that chair was made? I bet you um, there's no answer to it. I'm appalled that um, our economy um, was once based on what's been called creative destruction. I mean, the Industrial Revolution was about acts of, you know, acts of destruction because creativity is always, um, is always, um, um, is, is actually always, um, is, is always destructive. But lately, that's been turned around. Instead of, you know, instead of, you know, destructive, crea you know, um, <laughs> creative destruction, we've had destructive creation. And that's what's going on at St. Paul's and in, you know, and, you know, and in the park in, in, in New York. Um, you know, we, instead of making proper things like 
chairs. Uh, I mean, our economy has been obsessed with making things of absolutely no cultural value, and as it turns out, no economic value um, either. I mean, we said, witness what's going on at St. Paul's. You know, all that smouldering anger uh, we can see in the... Um, in the demonstrators you know, in you know, New York and London and elsewhere. It's actually, I think, it's really rooted in this business about the decline of manufacturing. Because without making things, we live in a culture which has lost, you know, lost its meaning. You probably many of you remember this time last year, um, Neil McGregor, the boss of the British Museum, had, did a fabulous radio series radio, on Radio 4 called The History of the World in 100 Great Objects. Fabulous, fabulous stuff. And one thing you're never going to hear is um, a, a program called A History of the World in 100 Great Credit Default Swaps. You know, I mean, I just do, I mean, I do believe this. I mean, what do I mean by meaning this culture? I did a little experiment before I came here. I go everywhere, usually carrying a brown leather bag which happens to be made in Brazil. I emptied the contents of the bag onto the table, and this is a short catalog. There was my fountain pen, which is German, rollerball pen made by Mitsubishi in Japan, a camera made by Nikon in Japan, my, my glasses, my Alan Mickley France, sunglasses, Ray-Ban in America, my notebook was an Italian moleskin, uh, my multi-tool was a leather man made in the United States, my car keys were, were for a Mercedes-Benz made in Stuttgart, my laptop was in there, it's a Mac. Uh, you know, my phone was made in Canada. And all of this, you know, in the culture of Josiah Wedgwood. I mean, Wedgwood was, we heard a lot about Steve Jobs recently, but, you know, I mean, Wedgwood was Steve Jobs, you know, you know uh, avant le mot. He was the prototype. I mean, Josiah Wedgwood, it wasn't just someone who could make great ceramic products. He actually knew about image he, uh, as well. I mean, he wrote sales catalogues. He also knew how a pyrometer worked. Uh, you know, he, he did the, the, he saw it as a totality. You know, from two centuries on, you know, the idea of, I think, Wedgwood mocks us and our miserable, uh, miserable economy. You know, one of the great questions, one of the great questions in all of history is how and why did the civilization, which they ours, which invented industrial production, why did it so, why did we so easily, uh, easily give it up? I think it'd be too crude to blame the bankers, although of course blaming bankers is always, uh, is always great fun. But I think what we can probably do is, uh, is apportion a certain amount of blame to the, um, to the bankers' pilot fish, you know, the, the economists. You know, in successive governments of, of, each, of each different persuasion, the economists, for one reason or other, have argued against manufacturing. And I think that's been absolutely ruinous. There's been a system, systematic bias in all economic, classic economic theory. If anybody, I've probably got some economists amongst you, but you, know, you will know in, in Keynes's general theory, there, is no, there are all sorts of um, uh, theories and accounts of how you raise productivity and, and increase wealth. Uh, but the I, but desire uh, yearning material things seem to play no part in Keynes or indeed in any other um, classical economist's imagination. I mean, this is because uh, uh, the classical economist's proposition is that, is that, is that uh, price alone dominates human incentives. Now, quite rightly, the idea that price um, is the most important thing is everywhere under attack, and that's because it's entirely wrong. I mean, that's why Stonehenge is here. No one knows what Stonehenge cost, and, and you know, no one, no one cares. No one matters. No one, people don't worry about the cost of the great adventures of the human spirit. You know, we, there isn't a profit and loss account for, you know, for the Great Western Railway, um, but we're very glad it happens. Solid products, things that are made, are, are, are surely amongst the, the, most, the most important things in our civilization. And I love the fact that Ali Kisagonis, the mini, the most, probably the most influential car of all time, certainly one of the most ingenious. Um, and I know what I'm saying is deplorable if you're a classical econo economist. Um, British Motor Corporation, it was introduced in 1959. It was only in 1976 that BMC realized they were making each car at a loss. Um, but I'm serious, but it, it sort of doesn't matter now, does it? Because we have this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful intellectual thing. Another car, another anecdote about cars, André Citroën, who of course, whose business went bankrupt and had to be bought by Michelin, but never mind that. André Citroën, he made some of the greatest cars ever. Citroën said, from the moment an idea is worth having, no one cares what it costs. And even better than that is something uh, the filmmaker Billy Wilder once said, and, and it was this. He said, I'll tell you one thing you never, ever, ever hear. It's this. You've got to go and see this such and such a movie. I hear it came in under budget. You know, it's, you know, you know I mean, I want to take cost doesn't matter. But anyway, as I said, just as classical economics is being revised by economists, you know, we've now got this thing called you know, behavioral economics, you know, nudge, nudge economics, econom, uh, economics. It, it actually appears that the economists may just soon be beginning to realize, you know, what makers have always known. And it's this, you know, that desire uh, is, is not numerical. I detest McKinsey. Um, the McKinsey view of the world, I can't think of anything more deplorable. Mr. McKinsey, who founded this 
dreadful business, said you can measure anything. And if you could measure it, you could manage it. Now, the thing is, you could only measure very simple, crude things. You actually can't measure all the important things in the world, like beauty, beauty peace, you know, love, um, love and happiness. You know, I think that you know, I mean, the world, or at least my world, is, is I want your world too, I hope, and our future world. It's, um, it's, we're going to move beyond the cold calculus you know, of, of metrics. Um, when I talk about that, you know, we're going to return to the, the, the joy, the pleasure, the, the, the engagement with making things. What I'm not trying to advocate, though, I'm not trying to advocate some sort of you know, you know, sentimental return to dirty old industry, you know, with ruddy-faced artisans in leather aprons working in sordid conditions in, in rural Surrey. I mean, Instead, so what I mean is, what my, you know, my campaign is, it's, uh, I just want people to better appreciate uh, the, the sort of universal benefits of actually making things. If you can make something, if you know how to make that chair, for instance, you actually you have to acquire um, very you know, superior mechanical skills, but you also have superior cognitive skills as well. The design of a stacking chair such as this, it was made by an American guy called David Rowland. I mean, the design of a, of a successful stacking chair is actually really at the outer limits of, you know, of human ability. You know, Teach that, and you're teaching something you know really, really valuable. The riveter, you know, my, back to my obsession with rivets. You know, if you if you rivet things, and I <laughs> recommend you buy a rivet gun at you know, the earliest possibility, you immediately, and I mean, to it from you know uh, from first principles, uh, you know, hand eye, you know, the hand eye, uh, you know, function, and you actually begin to understand at a practical level that old thing about form and function. No. And anyway, making things, that's, that's just a personal thing. I mean, it's personally rewarding to know how to, and it's an educational thing to, if you understand uh, the nature of making. And I earnestly recommend as the test as you go about your everyday lives, you know, ask yourself. I, mean, I always do it myself now, just asking myself, do I understand you know, how it's made? But it's, it's also got a larger sort of macro element, of course. You know, because in a country like ours, where we're all dragging around sort of five times our own weight in, you know, in mood-altering deficit. You know, there are all sorts of um, you know, other advantages, too, to, um, you know, to making things. It make you, you can understand ideas, materials, markets. Um, if you make money, uh, if you only make money, you, you, all you need is, as Lord Chesterfield said of somebody, you only need the, the morals of a whore and the manners of a dancing master. And, you know, when you make things, importantly, you restore that... Uh, really supremely important moral connection between effort and reward, which of course has been completely lost in the, um, in the flim flam of post-industrial sophistry. This is all actually beautifully, beautifully, beautifully explained in, in, a, in, a, in a sadly little known book by a California engineer called Julian King, who in 1944 wrote something called The, um, the Unwritten Laws of Engineering. <laughs> now what King explains here is that engineering isn't actually about you know, mechanics and you know, physics. Engineering making things. Engineering is actually about behavior. You know, if you, if you live in a culture which manufactures, you know, a, small, you know, a small unit or a larger culture which manufactures things, uh, you have to, um, you, the manufacturing demands that individuals have to be decisive and that they share in information. And this sort of positively, you know, aids you know, human, human development. Um, you know, you have to, if you're making something, you have to start with an idea, and then you have to become, you know, you, it evolves into a more elaborate specification, but it is in turn mass produced, distributed, consumed, recycled. At each stage of the manufacturing process, uh, additional skills and extra value are required and generated. And then there is the question too, back to the contents of my bag, you know, of national identity. Do we actually really want to live in a real culture, you know, or, or, a, or a ghost culture? Do we want to be an offshore shopping mall populated by 60 million owners of orphan-stitched mulberry handbags? Or would we actually prefer to be surrounded by, you know, well-considered um, and well-made meaningful products and buildings? I mean, are traditions just going to be quaint memories or should we be busy making the traditions of the future? Uh, my point is really that you, you don't get riots and looting in, um, in workshops. But there are actually some reasons, I mean, I, mean, I mean, this is not a council of despair, I'm actually quite stimulated by what's going on. I mean, there are some reasons for hope. Um, tomorrow afternoon, um, unless Ferrari gets terribly lucky, a British car will win the Brazilian Grand Prix. I mean, even if it's called a Mercedes. I mean, the Mercedes racing cars are actually designed and made in, in this Britain, in this country, in Brackley and Northamptonshire. It's quite astonishing that this late stage in our industrial decline, we'd somehow or other have managed to keep alive the, the advanced skills which are required to make successful Grand Prix cars. I mean, last week, happily, Dave, while he, he, he's, he skipped my lesson on rivets, but he went to see Mac 
McLaren in, the, in Woking, where uh, he saw it firsthand. Um, the extraordinary expertise that exists there. There is a form of British manufacturing that still exists that humbles all competitors. I mean, the, the, the Americans, the French, the, Jap the Japanese, the Italians, and the Germans have all tried to do well in Formula One in the past 50 years, and no one has actually done it as well as this. Um, you know, and I'm often asked if you're so clever, you know, what would you do to change our attitudes to manufacturing? And it was Dave's visit to McLaren which made me think this. What have you got to do? You realize that Formula One, for instance, it's a mixture of technology, craft, design, a bit of snake oil, research and development, material science, specialized manufacturing, aerodynamics, communications, multi-channel access, marketing, branding, teamwork, management, graphics, art, logistics, supply chain management, administration, sex, speed, and desire. In fact, Formula One has got all the things which are really necessary for a successful modern economy. I sort of think, I like to think in my fantasy, if I have my riveting fantasy, my chair fantasy, I also like to think that Dave might think Formula One should not so much be on the national curriculum, it, it, it should actually perhaps become, you know, the national curri curri curriculum. I'm serious. I mean, why not? I mean, who, who wrote the rule that education has to be boring and, you know, and dull? My point, anyway, about making things is this. Scientific invention and artistic creativity are not in themselves um, enough. I mean, creativity, we, we, we I mean, the old economists, I mean, Gordon Brown is always telling us we live in the creative Britain. Creativity can't exist autonomously. It has to feed off, you know, the, the, uh, you know uh, off manufacturing. The connection to workshops, you know, keeps ideas alive. You have to be able to make things in order to conceptualize them in the first place. I've got two supporters here. One is the president of MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, um, Susan Hockfield, who recently said, our, econ our American economy will only um, thrive when we make what we invent, and she's absolutely right, of course. And second is my old pal, um, is my old pal John Ruskin. Well, I used to think John Ruskin was a preposterous old Tory bigot, and I, perhaps I'm just getting old, but I'm, I'm coming to accommodate myself to him. Ruskin said, that, Ruskin said many wonderful things. The thing I like is this: men don't and can't live by exchanging articles, but by producing them. We don't live by trade, but by work. Now, if your work involves making things, you intuit the relationship between effort and reward. The banking system lost all connection between effort and reward. That's why it's wrong and why I'm right. We want to live in future in a workshop, not a casino, and perhaps spend our afternoons with a, a circular saw, a gulwaz, and a little red wine. Thank you. For more big thinking about the future, go to iq2if.com.